I, I felt the Spirit on that. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. Every word of that song spoke to my heart. And uh, this morning I'll be reading out of the NIV. Uh, so if the words are different, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to do it from this version because it said it best. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongues from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Are we good with the lapel mic, Scott? All right. Well, I am glad y'all are here this morning. And I kind of changed up uh, what I was going to preach this morning. I was going to preach the rest of the chapter, but I thought these five verses would be enough for today. And I know you're saying amen, because that had been a long sermon. Um, and I know this morning he starts out, finally, all of you, because I know some of you were here last week, and maybe you thought, well, I'm not married. This doesn't speak to me. Uh, but this is speaking to all of us, so this one should should speak to you today if last week didn't. But this section that we're looking at, these five verses, uh, Peter is bringing this section to a close, and he's going to give us some general instructions um, on relating to others. You know, he's, he's spoken to um, the slaves or the servants that we talked about. He's spoken to husbands and wives, uh, but he's speaking to the whole crowd this morning. And so <clears throat> his theme here is that God blesses holy living and that our circumstances should not determine our behavior, but our relationship with Jesus Christ should determine that. And so um, he begins, like I said, he, he addresses everyone here, all of you. And so he says these five characteristics that, uh, of holy living that as we relate to one another we want to put these into practice in our Christian life. This is what we're called to. And so we're going to look at these five things. Um, remember, Peter wrote to these elect exiles. Um, they're, they're being persecuted in their faith. They're being, uh, people are against them. But I think for us today, um, th these describe what the church should look like. When the church is described, words like this should come out. And we see those words there. Uh, unity of mind, sympathy, love, tender heart, <coughs> compassion, humility. Those words should describe the church. I don't know that they always do, uh, but, but that's what we want here. And so as we look at these five characteristics, number one, he says there is unity of mind. And unity is mentioned throughout Scripture, but I want us to understand that unity is different than uniformity. Uniformity calls for everybody to be the same. You know, we want everybody to act the same, dress the same, think the same, be the same. That's what uniformity is. I mean, the word uniform. You know, with these schools that put all the kids in uniform so they all look the same. But God calls us to unity. And unity, on the other hand, is about pursuing the same goals. It doesn't mean we all do it the same way or we all think the same way. It means that we're, we're in pursuit of the same goal. So Peter calls for unity of mind here. Uh, in other translations, you may see the word harmony. And that idea of harmony, I think, helps to see what he means. <coughs> when it comes to music, harmony is the combination of musical notes and a chord. Any musicians out here? You know what I'm talking about? Chords and, and harmony. When you play a chord, you're playing a series of notes. And you can't play just any series of notes because they don't all sound good together. But a chord takes notes and puts them together and makes a beautiful sound. And so that's what harmony is. Um, you know, you just can't bang, 
stany notes together and make music. There's a, a talent to that. So there must be harmony between the notes. Excuse me. So when you play the right notes together, you get this harmony. And these notes are different. Uh, they're distinct, but they all work together to make this chord. Another picture <clears throat> that I, I used as an illustration one time for a children's sermon was I had everybody in the praise team at the church I was at get up and sing or play something different. Like, you can imagine how exciting that was. You know, the drummer doing his thing, guitars, the singers singing all different songs. You can imagine. That would not be a concert you want to go to. When everybody is doing something different on their own, it, it sounds terrible. But when you take the drums and the guitars and the bass and the what other, other instruments and the, and the voices of the singers and you put them together in a song where they're all working together, you get this picture of harmony. Does that make sense? So th there's this idea that they're doing different things, they're playing different instruments, they're, they're using their voices, but the goal is the same, and it's to make this beautiful song. And so that's this idea of unity of mind that, that Peter's calling us to. So we are, we are different, we are unique by God's design, but as God calls us together to have unity of mind, we work together in harmony to accomplish what God has set out for us to do. That's what he calls the church to be. We're not all Bit Gibbses. We're not all Kent Gidrys or Courtney's or anybody else in here. You are you, and you've been gifted in the way that you've been gifted. You know, we don't want all of you coming up here to sing. You know, we, we don't, you know, most of y'all don't want to get up here and preach, and that's okay. But you have been gifted in a way that as we pursue this goal, God will use that gifting in a way. That's his unity of mind. There's a statement, and it comes from a 17th century theologian named Rupertus Maldinius, I guess. That's how you say his name. Uh, it says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in everything, love. You may have heard that said before. In essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in everything, love. And the essentials are those things that are non-negotiables when it comes to our faith. The essentials are things like the deity of Christ, that Jesus is God, or things like salvation is through Christ alone. Those are the essentials of this faith. We, we, we're not going to disagree on the essentials. like they're, they're, they're the foundation of our faith. But the non-essentials, they're the things that we have freedom to differ on. Things like what we wear to church. I had a conversation with a, a pastor last weekend that he told me he was, he was not comfortable if he got up to preach and he wasn't wearing a suit and tie. And I'm like, more power to you, because that is not me. I've been there. I've preached in a suit and tie before. But, but we have the freedom to differ on that, because biblically it doesn't say you've got to wear a suit and tie to preach, because that didn't even exist in the Bible times. Um, how often we celebrate communion. Some churches do it every Sunday. <coughs> Some do it once a year. Uh, we're going to try to do it once a quarter. And so as we as we get to the end of 1 Peter, we will celebrate communion again. Uh, translations of the Bible. Okay, that we, I, now I would say that some are kind of way out there. We have to be careful. But there's not a set translation that, that we should jump on and say, this is the one. And there are churches that say that. There are King James only churches. That's not us. Um, but there, there are these non-essential things that, that we have liberty in, which means that we don't condemn others for, for what they believe and what they use. But we trust God in, in liberty. But most importantly, we love. So our goal is not for all of us to be made alike, but to live lives that show the world God's grace and love through us. If you really think about what, what God is doing with the church you know, a church shouldn't all look the same. My hope and my, my desire would be for Redemption Church to be the most diverse thing in Deer Park. Because that's what heaven's going to look like. There's going to be other denominations there. There's going to be other, you know, people of all skin colors there. There's going to be all languages there. So to think that a church should look like 
you know, you know, we tend to lean towards uniformity when it comes to church. We want people that look like us, talk like us, and do like us. But that's not what church is about. And so he calls us to this idea of unity of mind where we begin to think in ways where we are pursuing the same goal. <clears throat> and this is accomplished by God's grace and empowerment. If you look at Romans chapter 15, <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Romans 15, verses 5 and 6, says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're here to speak one message, and that's the glory of God. We're speaking that one message, and, and it makes a beautiful picture when all of us come together, different backgrounds, different races, different whatever, and we come together as one, connected in the Spirit, and have this unity of mind. This is something we need to give ourselves to each day and trust in God to give us all we need to live this way. Unity of mind. The second thing that he calls to is sympathy. Sympathy. Both compassion and understanding for one another. This is understanding of the people around us. It, this word literally means to suffer with. To suffer with. So being sympathetic is caring about the needs, joys, and sorrows of others. That's one of the things that we're called to as believers because this is what Jesus displayed for us. He cared about the needs, the joys, the sorrows of other people. Read through the Gospels. We see Jesus do that. <coughs> this looks very different from the world, and it should. It looks very different from the world we live in. There should be an obvious difference in the way that Christians relate to one another compared to the world. We should have this, this desire to care for one another. <clears throat> Paul says in Romans 12, verse 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And that sounds easy on the surface, I think. Somebody's excited, let's get excited. Or somebody's <coughs> hurt and grieving. Let's grieve with them, but that's not always the case. It's not always easy to do that because there's things like jealousy. It's hard to get excited when someone maybe gets a promotion that we missed. <coughs> Paul also says in Galatians 6, verse 2, he says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now again, we're not under the law. We're not governed by the law um, of the Old Testament to say you've got to follow all these things, but we're still called to live it. And this is how we do it. We carry each other's burdens. And hopefully it's very clear to see that as believers, our lives become connected in ways that none of us should go through anything alone, whether we're celebrating or grieving. Part of what you're entering into when you come and, and, and give yourself to a church is to be connected with other believers who are going to care for your needs. That we shouldn't go through things alone. And I know that happens, and it doesn't reflect Jesus well or the church well, but we need to be that kind of church where we care for one another's needs. <clears throat> but at the same time, you've got to put that out there. We've got to know your needs. And we do this because we're a family. The third thing is he calls us to brotherly love. <clears throat> brotherly love. There seems to be this notion that we can love people even though we don't like them. You ever heard me say that? I mean, the Bible says to love them, but I don't really have to like them. But this idea of brotherly love is this brotherly affection. And I think there's, a, in a sense, we can treat people in a nice way. We can treat people in a nice way if we don't like them. But I think brotherly love still has a sense of emotion with it. There's a sense of connection that we need to have with believers. And I know it's hard to like everybody. It's really hard to like everybody. But with brotherly love, there's a familiar air, familiarity that comes with it. You know, like your favorite pair of jeans or a favorite sweater or maybe an old recliner that you feel comfortable in. Like you can plop back in it. It fits you because you've sat in it day after day after day. That's, that's kind of this idea of this brotherly affection we build familiarity with the people that we're connected with. 
And so we, we learn to love them. Brotherly love is the kind of love that, that you see when brothers pick on each other. Maybe brothers have a squabble. Anybody have siblings that you fought with before? None of, none of you? Okay. okay, we do that. I have a brother. <clears throat> we don't squabble much. <clears throat> Maybe because he lives, you know, out in Virginia. But brothers can have these squabbles, or siblings can have these squabbles, or these, these disagreements. But you know what? You let somebody else pick on them, man, we're right there. We're not going to let someone else do that. <clears throat> That's the idea of brotherly love. That we have those moments, but we're not, we're, we're going to stand and have their back when something comes up. So we're building this brotherly love amongst, amongst Christians, amongst each other. That as we come together, we build this affection. We build this familiarity with each other. We learn to love them through the things that maybe we don't like, that we don't enjoy about them. Because our goal is different. And so as God builds his people into one family, we experience this type of affection where we look out for one another, not because of how we feel about them, but because we're family. There's, there's something about family connection that's deep. And I know there's exceptions to that, and, and, and those are broken things. But when you look at the way that God intended family to be, they're very close connections. So we're called to this brotherly love. The fourth thing he calls us to is a tender heart. <clears throat> a tender heart. To be tender hearted means that your heart is easily touched. <clears throat> Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Being tender hearted is a command, but how do we become tender hearted if we're not? I think it comes from the understanding of God's tender-heartedness towards us. You think about that. God's tender-hearted towards us. You know, God could have looked at us and seen the mess we were in and not even bothered with us. I mean, you think about that. God can look and say, man, they made a mess of their life. What a mess they're in. But if you're touched by that, like if God looks at you and sees that you're in a mess, what, what is his response? It's not to cast you aside. It's to draw you in, to heal you of your brokenness, to fix the issue that's there, to heal you of your sinfulness. That's tenderheartedness. Um, and, and he does. He sees that we're helpless to do anything about our sin, and he sends Jesus to pay the price to forgive our sin. That's that picture of tenderheartedness. He didn't leave us in our mess. He didn't just leave us there. He responds in this tenderheartedness by sending Jesus. So this is what grace looks like, and being tenderhearted causes us to respond with grace, just like Jesus responded with grace towards us. And I know it's hard because people upset us and, and, and things happen, but we've got to learn to respond with grace. Because that's the only thing that God responded to us with. When he looked at us in our mess, in our, in our brokenness, he responds with grace. And he calls us to do the same. And so when you see somebody stumbling through this life and the mess that they've made of their life, our response is to be tenderhearted and to say, you know what, I've got something that can help you. And his name is Jesus. Because here's the thing, without God's grace, we'd probably be in the same mess. We'd be doing the same thing. <clears throat> the fifth thing is a humble mind. Your trans there are some translations may say the word courteous. So think of this, this idea of humble mind or this idea of being courteous. <clears throat> Humility speaks to the idea of considering others before yourself. Considering others before yourself. Paul again speaks to this in writing to the Philippians when he uh, says in Philippians 2, Verse 3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, <clears throat> but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Man, is that hard to do sometimes? Considering others before you consider yourself? That's not the way we're wired. That's not our nature. Our nature is I'm, I'm number one, and then everybody else comes second. 
But as we come into faith, as God, you know, begins to work in us, we begin to see that, that Jesus put himself last. He went to the cross for everybody else. And so we begin to do the same thing. This idea of humility, <clears throat> this idea almost seems countercultural because our culture tends to push a very me first, self focused attitude. I mean, think about what our, our world is just dealing with right now. Our country is dealing with, with people from, you know, all 700 genders there think there are, and everybody wants it to be about me. You know, everybody, you know, that believes what they believe, they want, they want their rights first. But this idea of humility is shifting the focus from ourselves to Christ first and others second. That's a hard place to put yourself. But we see Christ first and others second. And when we look at all these characteristics together, what we see is, at least what I see, is the kind of family that I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of a people who are sympathetic to one another, who are kind to one another, who love one another, who have this unity of mind. Because when you think about these five things and how if you take a group of people that are practicing these things and experiencing these things, that's an awesome group to be with. Because you walk in and you've got people that are care that care and are concerned about your needs. You, you, you've got a group of people that, that love you and that, that pour grace out on you when you don't deserve grace. Like That's, again, a picture of the church. This is what we're called to, <clears throat> to have relationships where you're known and cared for and supported and encouraged. So why do we do this? Why are we called to this? I want to answer that with verse 9. He says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. <clears throat> so we're called to this. We do this so that we may obtain a blessing. Again, we're called to live holy lives, <clears throat> to be set apart, to be different. We're called to live lives that look like Jesus. So it's obvious through reading Scripture that there will be people who are against us simply because we're Christians. You're going to have people that come against you simply because you profess Christ. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it's just somebody you run into. Maybe you begin a conversation and then you bring up, hey, I, I'm a Christian, you should come to church. And they're like, whoa, no, I don't want anything to do with you. But you're going to run into people who do that. <clears throat> Peter says that our response shouldn't be to return evil with evil or reviling with re reviling, but on the contrary, we're to bless. For those of you that don't know what reviling means, it means to criticize in an abusive or angry manner. People may criticize you. Anybody been criticized angrily before? Maybe you've been called a piece of junk or even worse. Maybe say, think people have said things about you. He says that our response should be, should be to bless. That's not your nature, is it? That's not what, that, not, that's not what one comes out. When somebody calls you something, it's not like we want to retaliate. So what does it mean to bless? It means to speak well of. So how do you speak well of someone who just said things about you? I think first, I think we go to God in prayer. In a couple of things, I think we have to pray for strength to bless, but I think we go to God and we speak a blessing <clears throat> over that person to God. That we speak well of them to God. And it could be that maybe they're having a bad day. This is where grace is poured out on those people. Because our natural response is to retaliate. So this is a work that requires us to submit to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit working out salvation in our hearts. It's not going to be easy. This comes from knowing God and knowing his word. <clears throat> so you've heard it today. I mean, we, we're, we're called to this, to not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling. But we're called to bless so that we may obtain a blessing. And part of the reason I, I, I've 
I've chosen verses out of Paul's writing that match with Peter's writing. And then Peter pulls out of the Psalms. He quotes out of Psalm 34. And I want, what I want you to see is that this is a common theme through the Bible. This is a common theme throughout all of Scripture. Look at, look at uh, verses 10, 11, and 12. And again, this is him quoting out of Psalm 34. It says, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now this isn't a formula to avoid persecution. See, there's a blessing that comes even though we may face persecution when we stand in our faith and respond with grace. I was reading this morning in uh, 2 Samuel. <clears throat> it's one of those times where God said, okay, this, this is good and it's going to go with your sermon. So then I had to scramble around and get it into my sermon this morning and change the PowerPoint and all that. But in 2 Samuel uh, verse, uh, chapter 22, this is David, and this is a song that David sings. And David, this is towards the end of his life, and this is part of the song that he sings. But starting in verse 17, he says, He sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him. And I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. You see, David was not a perfect man. David sinned. But David desired the righteousness of God. And he pursued that. And when he failed at that, he would come to God and repent. He didn't make it his lifestyle. He made righteousness his pursuit. And so that's kind of what Peter is saying here. If you desire good life, if you desire to love the life that you're living and see good days, he says, keep your tongue from evil. You know, I think this, this idea is twofold. I think there's a blessing in the fact that we get to spend eternity with God, but I think he blesses us here and now. Because he says there, whoever desires to love life and see good days. Who doesn't want good days on this earth? I mean, I do. I want things to be good. If we do that, if we desire that, it doesn't mean that, that life is going to be easy and, and everything's going to be comfortable, but it means that we're going to see God and we're going to experience His blessing. It says, let Him keep His tongue from evil and His lips from speaking deceit. God, we've got to watch what we say. We get to choose how we say things and what we say. And believe it or not, you don't have to say something. You don't always have to say something. And I want to, to tack on social media to this because your profile is part of you. So, so social media is not this free space for you to say and do whatever you want to do, and it's not attached to you. It is. It's just an extension of your voice. And I think it's easy to get on social media and, and post things because we hide behind the screen. So I think we have to keep our, our tongue from evil and our lips from speaking deceit and our fingers from typing those same things. He probably would have said that in Scripture if they had it then. We've got to allow God to shape our hearts because that's... The Bible says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if those things are coming out of your mouth, or those things are, are typing onto your social media, 
that's, that's a, a red flag for you. That's a warning light to say something's in my heart. I've got to let God have control of this. This is what I was talking about with David. He wasn't a perfect man, but he came to repentance. So we've got to come to this repentance and say, okay, I struggle with this. When someone says something to me, I want to say something back. That desire may be there, but is your choice to say it or withhold it? And they may deserve it, but we don't always have to say it. It says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Do you realize you choose what you pursue? What are you pursuing? What kind of life are you pursuing? A life of peace? A life of good? It says that we should seek peace. Seeking peace is seeking to do what is good for relationships. For those of you that are married, is there peace between you and your husband or you and your wife? The way we seek peace in marriage is we seek peace, we seek to do what's good for the relationship. You know, a lot of times we think we like peace, so we want others to do what's good for me. But what if we turn around and we begin to do what's good for them? That's seeking peace. And again, why? Look at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You see, because sin hinders our relationship with God, he will withhold blessings and he won't listen to our prayers when we pursue evil. This kind of ties back to what we talked about last week about husbands living in a proper way with your wife so your prayers aren't hindered. And here he applies it to all of us. We've got to live in such a way that our prayers are not hindered. I believe God wants to answer prayer. And when I say prayer, I, I'm not talking about God helped Fluffy, he you know hurt his knee. I'm talking about when we pray God's blessing over our families, when we pray God's uh, hand to, to grow us in our faith, when we pray for the salvation of our neighbors, when we pray for just a movement of God. Huge prayers. God moving prayers. God sized prayers where, where God does things bigger than we can even imagine. But God doesn't listen when we hinder our relationship with sin. And so we've got to choose what we pursue. And so I encourage you. These are five verses that we're looking at this week. I want you to lay your life beside these five verses, okay, and say, you know what? Am I seeking the goal of of Redemption Church with my church? Am I loving my brothers like, like family? And when I say Brothers like family, I'm talking about other Christians, other believers. If you say I'm a Christian, we're talking about other Christians. When when we look, am I being sympathetic? Do I really celebrate when people celebrate? Do I really weep with them when they weep? Can I come alongside them and just sit next to them when they're hurting? Do I have a tender heart, a humble mind? Am I willing to put myself aside to, to better this relationship. And we begin to assess that, and we begin to look, and we begin to come to the Holy Spirit and say, okay, God, this is where I need some work. This is where I need to lay my life before you because I am, I'm not getting it. <clears throat> and it's okay to be there, and you've got to recognize, but it's not okay to stay there. And so this is a process that we're going to continually give to the Lord. The title of this section in my Bible is called Suffering for Righteousness' Sake. Are you willing to suffer for righteousness' sake? That's what we're called to do. Because God wants to bless us. And He will withhold that blessing if we choose our own way. And ultimately, we've got to keep in mind that His blessing is when we finish our time on this earth and we enter into his presence, man, it's going to far outweigh what we can imagine. So hold on to that. Hold on to that blessing. Trust in his blessing. 
Trust in what he's called us to. So as we take some time to, to just focus and reflect this morning, I, I've got the questions on the screen to, this week. I didn't mess that up. So we're going, I'm going to pray, and then I will stand and just take this time of reflection, and then we'll close it out. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you've called us to. God, as we look at these things, I think for most of us, we desire these things. We desire sympathy and humility and, and, and unity and, and love. But there's times that, that we don't reflect those things, Lord. And I pray that you would call us to repentance where we don't. And I pray that you would guide us into those things where we live those things. And God, we trust in your spirit to do that in us. God, we thank you that you do want to bless. And I pray that we would live lives that opens up your blessing for us, both here and now and in the eternity to come. So thank you, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Mm-hmm.